he's not a fan of me, but I love him. Justin Rogers, welcome back to the Spiro Avenue Show. This is probably the bottom five way I want to spend a free evening. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I grew up Bloomfield Hills, you know, it's not easy it gets, but kitty corner from for now. So seems what, about right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's very fitting. What did Akuda have to do for you to be like, oh man, I do have some concerns. Like pass was, out on the field for It was an awful room. Oh, well, you it's, got T's Tabor, so I'm, I want to get Bill Clinton hadn't even been impeached yet when Sean Springs was drafted at that spot. And if you're going to make an exception that hasn't been seen since before Monica Lewinsky's dress got splooged out. Is that your second Bill Clinton impeachment reference? Man, you just just full on hyperbole through the whole thing. I liked what, it. What did I? Well, okay, the wheelchair was not literal, but other than that, wheelchair, I, Pilates, dumb. I mean, it's all of it. <laughs> I'm, look I'm, at this graphic. I am told. I am told look at this gritty, pixelated picture to make her look like she's a felon. Oh, there's a question. Yeah, well, if you kept interrupting me, I would have gotten to it earlier. Oh, look. I mean, give me the slate numbers. Okay. Stop going around okay. circles. You're, you're generally pretty off-putting, so it makes sense. It's the worst speed round of all time. I don't know. I thought it was the best speed round of all time, personally, Justin. But, you know, a lot of people, that was a very polarizing episode. And I can't wait to talk to you tonight. I'm fascinated to see where you're at with this whole Detroit Lions thing. I think we're in unique territory here. And I'm curious to dig into your brain because in my lifetime, I've been around this Lions fan experience. I have no recollection of this team being this hot in terms of perception, in terms of sheer energy to whatever extent you can quantify that. I want to, before we get to you, and we're going to get to you in a second, Ben, take us through what some of the national pundits are saying about this Detroit Lions team very close to the eve of the draft coming up. Let's take a look at that. Um, the Detroit Lions, man. The uh, hype yeah, this offseason. That was my next one. Great one. Everybody, myself included, loving what they're doing in free agency. They have the sixth and the 18th picks on top of all the stuff they did in free agency, and they went nine and eight last year. And that division stinks. I'm so excited to see another year of this regime of Dan Campbell. It's not a joke. It's not about biting kneecaps. It's not about hard knocks. It is about beating really good teams and games that matter. And everything says playoffs next year. Detroit Lions playoffs. James, it's fun to say. You don't get to say it much. It's kind of weird to say this because they are the Lions. But if the Lions don't make the playoffs in 2023, it's, it's going to be a disappointment. I'm all in on this roster. Restore the roar. I really like what they're building in Detroit, and this is an ascending team. All right, so that you get a little taste of what's going on there, and I'm sure you've heard some of this. And I'm going to frame it like this. Ben, throw up the odds, because I want to actually get a number down to demonstrate why this is unique, and it's not just talking heads. There's an objective metric here. The NFC North title odds right now, this morning, on DraftKings, the Lions are plus 140, a clear-cut favorite ahead of the Vikings 250, the Chicago Bears 350, and the Packers, they're kind of hedging. They don't know what to do with the Rodgers situation, plus 500. I went and did the research. Is this a conflict of interest for you? It feels like some Kirk Cousins slander. There's no slander whatsoever. Okay. I'm a Kirk Cousins defender okay. and apologist. All right. And there's no bias whatsoever involved with that position. Okay. But I did the research. Yeah. It was on that graphic. I, didn't I went by year by year. This is the first time the Detroit Lions have been favored to win this division going into the year since 1992. That team went 5-11. and 11. They were disappointing, but they were coming off of the Lions' last NFC division win sure. in 91. So that is an objective measurement that we, it, for the first time in 30 years, yeah. The Lions are not only favored, but clearly favored. Even in 92, they were a slight favorite. It was by a hair. We're in uncharted territory in my entire lifetime. I'm, I'm not that old. I mean, I'm 36, but I'm old enough that that means something. What do you make of this? What do, is this a legitimate hype? Are we all getting bamboozled? What do you make of it? Really quickly, Ben put together that intro. He did. <laughs> he nailed how I feel about this show. Yeah. Well, Just yeah. Just nailed it. I couldn't find you saying nice stuff, actually. So wow. I was hoping to get a little balance, but yeah. there was there was nothing nice said. Yeah, uh, it's weird. It's 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 very it's a very strange time. You know, I um, I'm from here, right? Like so, I mean, I I've grown up very aware of the the reputation of the Lions, and you know that goes beyond the the career. Um, so I've been in journalism since 2005. 
I've been on this beat, I think it's year 12. Um, and there's been some peaks, I guess, some, some little bits of success, uh, you know, particularly under Jim Caldwell, but never this legitimate hype. You know, I feel like, you know, there's hype and there's legitimate hype. And I think every year you see it in spring training in baseball or you see it uh, training camp for football. It's the we get these, um, you know, just rose colored glasses. Right. Everything's fresh and new and everybody's got a chance. Everybody's got a zero and zero record. Right. But um, you, you see what they're building. You see the strategy. You've seen it since they they tore it down to the studs in the very beginning and you knew it was going to be painful. Um, you I think legitimately probably thought it was going to take a little bit longer to, to turn the corner. I think people in the building, Chris Spielman recently said, you know, he it's, it's happened faster than I think a lot of people have expected. Uh, but you win eight out of 10 games, you are doing it. Maybe it's a little cliche, but you're doing it the right way. You're, you're building a strong foundation. You're managing your cap. Well, you're picking up draft assets for, um, you know, players that maybe aren't part of your long-term future, Matthew Stafford, TJ Hawkinson of the like, and you are spending wisely in free agency and, and using that draft capital successfully. And the expectations are, are legitimate. I, I think there was one clip in there that said that if they do not make the playoffs, it is disappointing. And I, I agree. And I, I think Dan Campbell has said as much, you know, the barometer, right now is a division title and we haven't seen that in this town since 93 um fort field has never seen a home playoff game which is uh wild in that in two decades that stadium has existed and um i don't know i mean there's obviously a lot of things that can go wrong in football really quickly but uh it feels like they've built something that is not just 2023 chance of success but really something that's potentially sustainable beyond that and the thing that's instructive to me is it's smart people are saying nice things because we yeah. have had these little blips in my lifetime where, you know, the sort of casuals, to use the term, are really excited about Mike Williams, Charles Rogers, and Roy Williams lining up together with Marcus Powered and Kevin Jones in the backfield. Like, so those we have had those moments of sort of fake water cooler excitement. But, yeah. like, actual smart football people are like, oh, shit, like, what's going on in Detroit? Yeah. I'm not shocked – that they got to that nine-win territory. I'm shocked, and you kind of alluded to it, by the timing. When I had Dave yeah. Burkett on the show, I said, I don't, I'm not a believer in, in Campbell at all. I made that clear from the beginning. But it's not that I think he's going to win three games every year. I said I think he can win nine, ten games. I think he's yeah. going to be similar to Caldwell. And I think he'll start in year three. He's, I never thought in a million years he'd be at that point with a winning season in year two. And even less so when they got off to the start, they did. right one and six. I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah, I just I think people are starting to see some actual meat on the bone with what they're doing, and I I think that I can't recall ever being in this boat. I mean, it's it's wild. Yeah, well, I mean, they're doing it the right way in a lot of ways, right? It's trenches. You know, you still win in the trenches of football. You use your your first round pick on guys like Panay Sewell and, and Aiden Hutchinson to set tones. You're you're adding the right character pieces. And when I say character, I'm not talking about, I'm talking football character, right? Like guys that set tones in the locker room and in practice, um, you know, what we'll get into things where we're right or wrong on, on guys or predictions or whatever. But I'm on Ross St. Brown was a guy I was wrong on, you know, when I watched his film, when he was drafted, I said, he, he, he looks like a guy that's going to work hard. He's not going to maybe give you more than 40, 50 catches in a year. He's going to block hard and people are going to like him as kind of gritty dude's a star and and he's a culture setting star he's a locker room tone setting star he sets the tone on the practice field every single day and i keep saying it like if you could find 10 of those guys on a roster you're you're a super bowl contender like that's you got 10 guys that are driven and passionate and have enough talent to um you know maximize the attitude into the body like you can win in this league and they're, they're doing it right now. Do you think Sheila Ford stumbled into what appears to be a better process? Or is there something you could kind of pin down of, here's what Sheila Ford has done yeah. differently than her parents. And that's why we're in this boat for the first time in 30 plus years. I, I think she does deserve a good deal of credit. And, um, you know, whether we want to say she stumbled into it or not is, um, you know, a, a, 
debate that you can have, but um, you know, what, what do they say often when you fire a coach? What, what's, what are you looking for in the next coach? You're looking for the opposite of that guy. Right. And so um, when they fired Patricia, you know, I think maybe a lot of us first thought was, Oh, now they're going to go find a young offensive uh, guru. You know, they're going to go find a Mike McDaniel or a Sean McVay type coach. And really what they did is they did go find the opposite. They went and hunted for a cultural opposite. Um, you know, there was very much a, a fortress like mentality built up following the Patriots model, you know, that, that regime, as much as they said, they weren't the Patriots, they mimicked everything, all their practice routines, their times, the Hill at Allen park, like all of that was copied directly from, it was, it was a Xerox. And, um, within that they really insulated football from every other part of the organization. And when, when Sheila stepped in kind of as that was at its end, she said, I don't want this. I want, I want this organization, this franchise to be this cohesive collaborative process. That's all working together from the uh, ushers at Ford field to the cafeteria workers at, at Allen park, to the players, to the coaches, to uh, the president or we, we want everybody kind of on the same page of what our goal is. And we don't want people that are insulated. We want people that are uh, working on achieving a goal together. Um, you know, the first move was Spielman uh, after the, the firings. And um, we looked at that and we're like, well, you know, what's his experience? I mean, we know he, what he was as a football player, a uh, great, great football player. We know what he was as a broadcaster and, um, they saw something there, right? Like whether, you know, his wealth of contacts or experience or just what knowledge he gained through all his various roles, they saw something there. It filled a, a football knowledge void that maybe existed between her and, and Rod Wood um, and, and kind of rounded out the, the search process for the GM and coach. And then they bring in a GM and coach that fit that, that cultural mold that's her vision. I mean, that's that's where I say she deserves credit. This was her vision is to have this this collaborative process. And, um, you know, I think it raised some eyebrows when you hire the GM and the GM doesn't have input on the coach. And that that can go very wrong really quickly. Right. And, um, you know, they, they deserve a lot of credit. The the four Mike Disner was was part of that as well. Um, the, the four that worked together to find these guys. It's, it's still early. They still haven't accomplished anything of note in terms of playoff appearances, division titles, you know, uh, playoff wins, obviously Super Bowl. But uh, I think we can all say it's it's trending in the right direction. And, and so far, those those hires, the process, the culture that they've tried to establish look successful. And I, I think that, yes, she deserves credit for that. See, I think the contrast between Matt Patricia and Dan Campbell is extremely easy to make. And then I mean, you would, no. uh, that that's a layup. I'm more curious about the Jim Caldwell versus Matt Patricia yeah. uh, versus um, Dan Campbell comparison, because that was what I like in Dan Campbell to before he coached a game in Detroit. Massive overlap, massive overlap. And right. I said this, right? So you went from Jim Schwartz to Jim Caldwell to Matt Patricia, Schwartz, Patricia, massive overlap. Yep. I mean, you do Venn diagrams, it's nearly a circle. Right. And similar with Caldwell and, and Campbell, you know, there's uh, maybe some some criticism of their game day management. But where they thrive is they manage people and they we, we talked about digging out of the one and six hole. Right. Well, the Lions did that under Caldwell one year, too, where they started off. I think it was one and five, finished nine and seven. I don't know if that was a year they went to the playoffs or, or just missed. But still, like they they fought out of the hole and, um, you know, uh, coach we were just talking to the other day that just joined the organization and they said like that's noticed around the league when when players don't quit on a guy like it speaks volume to the respect they have for that guy so um both both campbell and caldwell are genuine you know i think that they have an earnest care for the players i think they talk to them about their family and they care about their success and it's it's a deeply personal connection um they treat them like men as opposed to children or soldiers. Um, and that resonates in a locker room. And I think Campbell, where he's probably done a little bit better job than, than Caldwell and maybe why there's, um, 
a better chance of success. Uh, while one, the personnel from the, the front office is, is the, the plan looks a little bit better at this point, but I think that Campbell's done a little bit better job of, of surrounding himself with the right people. Cause that's what great leaders do, right? It's not just in football, it's in business, it's in politics. Like you fill the voids of what you don't know with people that do know. Um, and you know, uh, Caldwell took a shot with Jim Bob Cooter and it, it looked kind of good early and it obviously fell off a cliff. Um, Tara lost the same thing, like looked really good and, and fell off the cliff as, you know, some of those talented pieces left, but uh, Ben Johnson, I mean, it's talking to him is just, it's different. Like the guy is, is such the re- real deal. And, you know, uh, Campbell said it wasn't on purpose that he put so many former players in the coaching staff, but like, Maybe it wasn't his intent. Maybe it's just what he knew. But that strategy is really, it was unique and it's working. Like now you've got guys that have done it, right? And so every rookie that comes in, every veteran that signs are playing under, most of them, every, not every position, but most of them are playing under Hank Fraley or Randall L or Mark Brunel, like guys that went through it for 5, 10, 20 years and played in the league. And so they they can expect, speak from these really deeply personal experiences that resonate with players. And I think take them to a higher level because when somebody tells you that they know, cause they did it, that matters more. So, I mean, you just kind of made the argument, which you're going to hate when I clarify this, yeah. you made the argument that I nailed this take with Burkett two years ago, because everybody is screaming at me about how wrong I was about Dan Campbell. I was wrong about the Detroit lions record in year two. But in terms of the big picture, I'm not wrong until he does what I said he wouldn't do. And look, for the record, I am a Lions fan. I'm rooting to be wrong on this, yep. but I'm still not convinced. So you made all the case right there, all the, the various points for the case that Caldwell kind of is Dan Campbell. Caldwell was the most successful coach in Lions history. Also doesn't mean much, at least in the Super Bowl era. Sure. Why, if my argument was two years ago, this guy's Jim Caldwell 2.0, mm-hmm. and, and you're saying now, oh, yeah, that's pretty much a circle in the Venn diagram. Why would I think that he can expand beyond yeah. a 10 win? You know, is this guy going to go in the playoffs and get blasted? Jim Caldwell went 11 and 5. Yeah. I mean, what, what's the reason, if maybe there's not one, that he can exceed Jim Caldwell's achievements here? Yeah, I would say the the first thing that stands out to me is I I subscribe to the theory that um, fortune favors the bold, right? Like I think that aggressiveness in football is rewarded more often than not. I think we see aggressive coaches across the league awarded. Dan Campbell is aggressive, sometimes to a fault. I think he's had some moments where he's had to learn from those those mistakes. That's okay, you know. We all make mistakes in our jobs, and uh, his is going to have the magnifying glass on it. But I love the fact, and I think fans should love the fact, this guy is not afraid of anything. He's a, he's not afraid to put it in players' hands in big moments and test them, whether it's fourth downs or um, you know trick plays at, in big moments. And um, that stuff was really, really cool because it worked when they didn't have talent. And now that they're starting to have some talent around it, I think that's kind of maybe the difference because I, I look at the 11 and five Lions team and it was really good, really good. That defense was the best that we've seen in this town forever. And you can win championships with defense. That is a very true thing. And that Lions team at bare minimum should have won a playoff game, probably should have gone to the NFC championship that year. What happened? They go to Dallas, they jump out to a 14, nothing lead. They're looking like they're going to just, cook the Cowboys what do they do Jim Caldwell does what he does and he he takes his foot off the gas right Jim Caldwell's big thing was complimentary football and there's tons of value to complimentary football right like playing your strengths against your weaknesses and protecting against those weaknesses but that first year with Matthew Stafford I thought he broke him down too far you know you wanted to make him a better decision maker and you wanted to to mitigate the risk but what was Matthew Stafford's greatest asset? It was his arm. It was willingness to, to push the ball into to tight windows and make big plays and big moments. And I, I felt like he was neutered that season, right? And yeah, your defense was awesome and you leaned on him, but what happened? You get in that fourth down situation at the very end of the game 
And what do you do? You punt. And your punter shanks it. And then that defense that was so good lets you down because that's football. Things will happen like that. You can't guarantee anything. But what you did is you took it out of your control and you put it into their hands. You gave that team the ball. Dan Campbell's going for that fourth down. I guarantee you he's going for that fourth down. Is it going to be successful? I don't know, but I believe it'll be more successful more often than not. And I think that's why he has a chance to surpass the success that Jim Caldwell here. Does it end in a Super Bowl? I don't know. I know that's the ultimate goal. I, I don't know. I can't say that. I don't know if um, they're going to hit on the next draft. I don't know if the free agents they sign are going to pan out, but I think if they get in those moments and they continue on this upward trend, I, I do think that this regime of of Campbell and, and Holmes, you know, I think Holmes is a big part of it too, will surpass the, the Caldwell Mayhew and Caldwell Quinn eras. I think you just gave the best possible answer to my question and something I had not even thought of. And this is why I bring you in here and why I, I have so much praise for your work. I had not even thought of that because I couldn't find the difference other than that they look different. I, to me, there's so much overlap. Obviously, Dan Campbell is more gregarious, but in terms he's of a lot less polished. Well, in, in, in terms like of the best way, but right, way less polished. Those differences are obvious, but I mean, in terms of organizational structure and ethos, it is player friendly, more rest than you know, grinding them into the ground. I never even thought about the aggressive angle, which you admitted was to a fault in year one, but I think he's reined it in. I think that fourth down, I was at that game, it was horrible. Uh, I think it was a fourth and one too. It wasn't like it was, four, it was fourth and one or two. Right. And it was, it was coming off the, the call, you know, everybody wants to blame the officials Picked in that moment flag. and that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. I understand. I can put myself in fan shoes and understand why they're so upset in that moment, but I also can look at it and understand why they picked up the flag. I, I do. It, it's not a good look. It doesn't even matter though. Those it doesn't matter. Mutual it doesn't exclusivity matter. But issue you, here. you allowed the negative momentum from that play, you let the mindset sleep and the, the, the same old lions, you know, you don't think the players know and hear and understand that and feel the weight of failure of this organization. Um, you gave that away by punting, you gave it away. And then your punter, I mean, I still remember like Sam Martin's like, I, I was debating between two punts, two different types of punts until the ball got in my hands. And I tried to do half of each. And that's why what happened. That was bad. But like, you you put the doubt in your players' minds, and I think that's something else that that Campbell just doesn't do. Like he, so many coaches have rejected the history, right? That's not my problem. It's just not. It's and they're right. It's not their problem. Like it exists, but like why should you have to inherit the weight of sixty years? That's not fair. But Campbell has, and he's done it by choice, and he he hammers over their heads that like. They expect you to fail. This is how long it's been since this. He uses it as, as a motivational tool. and um, He plays into that with his players? Yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, that, that stuff's all over the building. I don't think I've ever seen that. Like, yeah. I don't, I'm not saying it's never appeared on camera. I don't yeah. think I've ever seen him like, I've seen him embrace the, hey, you know, you got to win. They've heard this for a long time yeah. at his introductory press they, conference. But not with his players. Those players now. know, like, they haven't won a division title in this town. In Good. I'm sick of that well, shit about, oh, it's not yeah. my fault. Because we heard that from John Kitna, Stafford, Harrington. Oh, I just got here. Yeah. Oh, okay, we didn't just get here. Yeah. So I don't want to hear it. Like, good for you. I, You're paid to figure it out. And again, I get, I take, I understand both sides of this, right? Like I understand the players and the coaches that don't want to take that on, but fans, you, you want to hear them taking on, you want to hear them embrace it and use his motivation. And, and Campbell has been that guy for you. He has been that guy that is making his players know what they're fighting against and what they're trying to accomplish. I mean, everybody says they want to win for the city, but like it feels at a different level with him. Like it, he, he really does feel like ingratiated to the city, to the organization, whether it's from playing here or whatever. Like he just, the connection is very, very deep for him. At 2014 team, and I'll finish there with this point. Yeah, it's the best I mean, Lions team. Uh, that was a Super Bowl roster. I can't remember if it was PFF or DVOA, and obviously the stats have changed because we've yeah. played a decade of football since. But in that year, they were saying the Lions, by their metric, was the second best offense since – the 2000 Ravens. So like defense, uh, defense, right? Yep, so, yep. Yeah. Second best defense. And so, okay, we have one of the 
two or three best defenses in 15 years in the whole NFL. No like, doubt. if you're ranking all 30 teams, like, every year for 15 years, we'd be in the top three yep. defensively. Outstanding at every level. And your offense was Calvin Johnson, Golden Tate when he was still a star, Reggie yep. Bush when he was still very good, 1,000-yard guy. Yep. I, I mean, even Pettigrew, like, we called him a bust, but was a yep. functional, solid tight end. It was I mean, Ebron's rookie year, right? Was he there yet? Because I think I, I think the debate the next year. I think the debate there was the do you draft Aaron Donald? Oh, because was, Sue and Fairley are probably leaving. The that that's one of those that drive me nuts because yeah. it, people it's good. we're going to hit all the well, greatest hits tonight. Well, very briefly with that, yeah. I'm just saying the whole like oh hindsight's 2020. Hindsight's 2020 for the people that are like oh you should have drafted Odell Beckham. Nobody was saying that. Lions fans like actually wanted Aaron Donald. Yeah, I wanted Aaron Donald, yeah. and I was not. Alone. I mean, that was the majority opinion. Mm -hmm. So that was like, why am I smarter and the fans smarter than the GM? It drives me nuts. I want to transition to this. We have to do it. I, look, I'll, I'll get it up from the top. Jared Goff. Yeah. Open disclaimer. And I've, I've talked about it with you. It, it was before his first season when you were here with me talking about mm -hmm. it. I think Jared Goff is the most unfairly maligned, uh, criticized, dragged in the mud player that i can recall in the last 20 years in the nfl damn I, I i can't think of a better example there may be somebody tied i can't think of someone that was more unfairly criticized okay. there's been more guys more criticized jared goff is treated like he's a piece of garbage and sean McVay, whom i don't i don't dislike sean McVay. i was rooting for stafford to win when they did but you read that article that came out on the in espn after the fact about how he was treated in that facility he's yeah. been shit on he gets here Everyone's kind of shitting on him, all oh, bridge quarterback, all this stuff. I, I've always thought he got a bad rap. I didn't think he was as good as Stafford. I agreed with you two years ago. Sure. Obviously, there's a reason two first-round picks and a third-round pick came along. No doubt. I have not been shocked by how well he's played. And yeah. I, I argued with Jim Costa before that first year that golf was here. I, it's on tape. I'm like, this guy will be really good if you protect him, if they protect him at all, which they've done. Yeah. You were a skeptic. I mean, your your words on my show were, he's solid. Nick Baumgutter said the same thing. He's pretty solid. You weren't yeah. ripping him, but you're like, he's so limited in what he can do, how he can run things. Mm -hmm. Just watching him practice, you were saying how different the arm talent is and their command of, of the field and the offense. We know the arm talent. We don't have to visit that. Everyone knows Stafford's got more arm talent. Sure. Have you been a little bit impressed, surprised, however you want to phrase it, with how well it's looked, or is this kind of what you thought could happen? No, it's it's been better than I thought. Uh, I'll, I'll go that far. Um, so when he got here, uh, the pieces were not there. Yeah. Um, that training camp, I I distinctly remember leaning over to another reporter. I don't remember which one, but I was like, this this might be the worst offense in football. Like, I know it's early in training camp. I know there's still some chemistry being built, but Tyrell Williams didn't end up doing anything. Brashad Perriman got bounced. Like, there there was just uh, Amon Ra. I wasn't you know, sold on him at that point. Obviously he, he developed into, you know, th what he has, but like it, it was bad. And then you had Anthony Lynn, who um, it's just a, it's a conservative brand of football that, that he coaches. And so um, not, not a great brand of football to have on a bad football team. Um, so they go out and they surround Jared with a boatload of weapons in, in this last off season. Um, I liked the shark shark pickup a lot. Uh, didn't fully work out. I think the way they envisioned. Maybe maybe saw it in the last five games, but uh, the idea was there. Jamison, we haven't seen yet uh, for what he could be, but um, I, I just I liked the balance. But Ben Johnson is is a factor, right? There's there's something special about the way he communicates to the players, the plan, and uh, what really resonated when I was talking to him last season before the season just just on the relationship with Goff and uh, the chemistry there was he really hammers home that he wants his players to understand the why of the play call he doesn't need them to to just understand the the x's and o's and yeah i called you know this this string of commands and this is where this guy's got to be he wants those guys to know why that play call is being called on second and nine in the second quarter with four minutes to go what it's setting up potentially for the future. He wants to, to, to understand the philosophy of it. And he and Goff are very much on the same page in that regard. Um, but I thought Goff answered some, some questions to specific skill set criticisms that I had about him and certainly wasn't alone. Um, thought he handled pressure 
much better last season than than ever. Decision making, you know, you look at his history. I um, got a little bit of a back and forth with with his position coach Mark Brunel last year about Goff's propensity for making one big mistake a game. His his film said it. His his number said it. He was averaging more than interception per game or turnover per game. Like that's a that's a killer for teams. He goes out and what he's got three hundred and twenty nine consecutive passes without interception and sure some of them were fluky drops or whatever but that's still that's remarkable to take that out of your game and then uh the deep passing right like you know we could say arm talent or not but like he just wasn't even it wasn't even in play for him for large stretches of the first year and really you know really large stretches of his final year or two in in la but uh, the deep passing was there for him the lines keep putting deep threats around him because they believe he can do it there's a reason they added tyra williams there's a reason they added DJ Chark. There's a reason they added Jamison Williams because they believe that Goff is capable of utilizing those players. And I think we saw that through last season. So yeah, it, it was better than I expected. You know, I, I think maybe my thought his ceiling was top 10, top 12 quarterback. The the season he delivered last year was closer to top five statistically. And, um, you know, a lot of those same pieces are back. Uh, Marvin Jones is a little bit different than DJ Chark, but we'll, we'll see what they do in the draft. Maybe they give him a tight end or something else to, to add to that mix. But David Montgomery is a better back than Jamal Williams. So the offense hypothetically could be better in 2023. Yeah, I mean, for, for my money, I, I'm getting kind of exactly what I thought I could get if things were set up appropriately. Yeah, I, I just this is not shocking to me like it was to some. I just I think the data was there that if you protect him, he plays well. If he yeah. has weapons, he plays well. The numbers are almost exactly the same as his two Pro Bowl seasons. So yeah. you did. You had you had evidence that that player existed. You gave him the pieces. You gave him the coaching. You got the same results. Yeah, and there was no there was no injury. There was no you know he didn't get ten years older. I mean that right. was always in there, and I, I think that's been demonstrated. I mean I don't know how far down MVP ballots go for the NFL. I know I think baseball, it's like six or seven. Like he would be on my MVP ballot last year. I'm not saying I'd vote him to win, but he'd be like six on my MVP ballot, maybe seventh. I thought he was that good. Yeah, I, I don't have a response. I, I I guess that's something I'd have to really think about. Well, look at. I, I mean, I you're not cracking the top three, so I mean, no, he's, no, right. he wouldn't yeah. be top. He wouldn't be yeah. top three. I'm so, like, I was thinking about it because I tweeted it at the yeah. time. I'm like, shit, if I'm really going on the list, yeah. I might have him at like seven, yeah. seven or eight. Like, I mean, that's nobody really I, saw. You're that probably coming. you're probably not alone. Yeah, yeah, well, I was probably impressed. a few top ten votes. Sure. He remains despite the year he had though, and that's what's fascinating yeah. to me. He's already vindicated. He's proven it. Yeah. There's some people that are more on board. Jim Costa still wants the guy burned in effigy if, if, from a career perspective. Ben, play at the sort of yin and yang two video mashup, the varying takes on Jared Goff, please. Jared Goff's been tough, gritty. They had the number four offense in football, so they're going, why do we want to change much this year? We're, we kind of got something going here. You know, but am I sitting here saying I'm sold on Jared Goff for the future to hold down this spot as the starting quarterback for the Lions for the next five or six years? No, I'm not. There's still things about his game that I just think I'm not sure it's going to get them over the hump in big moments. So, no, I wouldn't draft a quarterback. Again, he's better than the quarterbacks that are coming out in this year's draft for you. So, you know, just cut him off mid-sentence. Well, actually, he he kind of launched into something that was completely unrelated. A little bit of okay. a rough cut there. So, yeah, it's Keyshawn, man. He's kind of like he jumps all over the sure. place. But you you get the idea, and that's I think a representative example of like you do have sort of the golf you know, supporters or believers, whatever you want to call it, more like me, and then you have people like Chris Sims that are saying hey, he's all right, but like come on, you got to get him out of there. I and mean, Sims goes on for twenty minutes in that video, a little bit before, a little bit after how the Lions should draft somebody at six. And it's like, he's out on golf effectively. Yeah. Where are you at? I mean, that's, I know it's the most obvious question with, I would argue this draft is, is quarterback in play at six or not Yeah. at six. I don't care about the third round. Sure. At six. Is it in play? It's, it's an extremely complicated discussion because it's the most important position on the field. Correct. And, Goff's limitations that he will not overcome is the lack of mobility, right? And so we're seeing this this shift in the NFL to embracing the dual threat quarterback, right? And those dual threat guys are the top on the top of the cream of the crop in Patrick Mahomes and 
Josh Allen and Joe Burrow, maybe a little less so since his injury, but still like guys that can extend the play outside the pocket can still make plays downfield, but also can take off and run for 20 yards. If, if given the situation, Jared Goff's never going to be that guy. And then you have the financial component of it, right? Goff's due for an extension. You know, he's got two years left on his contract. The extension probably comes next year, but what are you going to pay Jared Goff? And that's probably four, north of 40 million a year. And that's fine. That's what he's worth. That's what the market says he's worth. But there's so many teams that have succeeded with the rookie quarterback contract model. And, um, you know, I was, I was laughing the other day because CJ Stroud is one of those, those quarterbacks in the mix, right? Yeah. Yeah. Draft C.J. Stroud if he's there at six. The NFL.com comp for him is Jared Goff, and it just made me laugh, right? Like, obviously, Stroud's probably a little bit more mobile, a little bit more athletic than Goff, but um, mechanically, I, I get it. Like, there's there's a lot of similarities there, but guess what? He's going to cost $26 million for the next four years versus $40 million a year. So that's where, that's where that side of the conversation happens. Um, you know, I, I go back to what I've always said about Stafford, right? Like, if you put enough talent around him, you can win a Super Bowl. And it happened, right? Rams put a preposterous amount of talent around him. I don't know how they got that much talent, and that I guess they're paying for it now, but they won a Super Bowl. And I, I believe the same, you know, about Goff. He he got to a Super Bowl with a very talented Rams roster. I think it could absolutely be replicated here in Detroit. Um, I think he could win it in the right circumstances, but there is there is room to improve that position. I do. I think they're going to draft a quarterback at six. I don't, I don't think they're going to trade up to three. I don't think they're going to roll the dice, but like Anthony Richards ceiling, his ceiling oh, come on. is higher than Jared Goff's. But what are the odds of hitting his ceiling? Right. If you're rolling two dice and the ceiling is rolling snake eyes, you know, that's, that's a big risk. And I yep. thought, Brad Holmes put it perfectly in his end of the year press conference and it was subtle, but he said, it's a lot easier to get worse at a quarterback when you have one than to get better. And I agree with that. I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, I don't begrudge any fan that, that wants to, to try to take that shot to get better. I wouldn't even uh, criticize a GM to, to taking that shot because, you know, again, fortune favors the bold. You got to really, you know, take some chances sometimes to achieve greatness, but um it's it's a risk I don't see them taking at this stage in the rebuild. And I think what we've seen in the NFL now, there's there's more than one path to add a quarterback. So if you get to the point where you feel you have a Super Bowl roster and, and Goff is the maybe the piece that's holding you back in two years, there's other there's other avenues. I, obviously the Rams proved it in shipping him out for Stafford. So you know. Yeah. I mean, I said last year, because this, this, we had this conversation last year, uh, not you and I, but uh, like the collective Detroit, and I sure. said there's no chance they draft the quarterback last year. I, I'll elevate it to maybe a 1% chance. I would be absolutely stunned. I'm talking about with that first pick. Yeah. I'm not talking about later. Like I would be absolutely shocked whether it's a trade-up or they yeah. sit at six. I'd be stunned if they drafted a quarterback. I just don't believe that. And you laid out the point why. If you are starting – it's hard enough to hit on a quarterback. If you're starting from scratch, effectively, where we don't have a viable quarterback on the roster. Sure. We just don't have one. We have, you know, I don't know, take your pick of like John Kitna back in the day. We got nothing. Yeah, you're the Colts. You're ch- perfect. Perfect contemporary example. Your chance of that quarterback select being a, a good selection is a lot higher because I don't have a quarterback. Yeah. If I draft another Jared Goff, who's a B or B plus by most measures, that's a win. That's a good pick. Absolutely. I got a real guy now. If you already have the B plus quarterback, B B plus quarterback as the Lions do, now it's already hard to hit on the B B plus guy. Now I gotta draft a top five guy in the league to really justify it. Because don't tell me that if golf's the ninth best guy and we get the seventh best guy, you're talking about a negligible difference at that point. You better you better get a a sliver under Mahomes or Burrow. I mean, you you better hit a lock step like surefire Hall of Famer if you move on from golf and that's what people don't realize it's oh they like this guy or that guy he better be an a plus i don't think there's an a plus in this draft if there is there's no good bet i don't think there's a trevor lawrence i don't think there's a burrow there's guys that i like i I think that's the argument right because you you have to you have to go through such a narrow crack in the wall to make that a justifiable decision in hindsight i just i think it's a fool's errand to even try well and 
here's the other thing you you risk um you risk ruining Goff, right? Um we we've seen kind of how he reacts to when an organization doesn't throw their support behind him. Um you know, and I'm not going to say it's a flaw or anything. I think there are plenty of people that um you know react negatively and and regress when they're not supported and um Goff has shown some of those traits and I think you could ruin that and potentially miss on the pick when this is an opportunity to add maybe a premium player at another position and continue the ascent of the rebuild. Yeah. And I, I think, again, you have the good quarterback in place. What if you add a blue chip guy in one of your areas of weakness, they've already yeah. addressed the secondary like crazy. I, I just, if you get, have a chance to add a big edge, Will Anderson would be the biggest layup ever. Uh, but yeah, I think that's ambitious. It'll be there at six and I don't sure. trade up for non quarterbacks in the top 10 I'll trade up in the third round for somebody or you know into the late first round I don't do that for for top five top 10 guys but I I think it'll be interesting to see what they do at quarterback later because I don't think it's coming up early but who cares I like Goff and I mean you said that ESPN article I wish I could remember the name of the reporter she did such a good job with that Rams falling out but there were components of that where she's citing sources in the Rams building about why it went awry with Goff and it's multiple sources in this article are saying it's well known in the Rams facility. Golf thrives when he's in a more positive environment. I agree. And and yeah. McVay was the opposite. It was toxic. Even McVay came out and admitted he yeah. didn't handle golf well. I mean, the, even the guy, the horse's mouth said it didn't work out. He didn't do a good job. So I'm with you. Golf needs that. And when the second Golf got to Detroit, the videos they posted him online. He's walking through Allen Park for the first time. They were treating him like a, a hero had arrived, and yeah. I think that was intentional. And I think it didn't. It didn't. Still, I mean, he had a lot to. It was trauma, right? Like, yeah. I don't think he expected to be traded. He certainly didn't expect to ship to a organization that was tearing it down. He was going to, have to lead a rebuild. Like, it took him a while, and probably well into that first season, to get over the trauma of his situation. But you saw what happened when he did embrace it. And I, and one other point I wanted to make about you know I, I I think we all frequently and I've I've also referenced that the Lamar Jackson to replace Joe Flacco and the. Patrick Mahomes to dra- replace Alex Smith. Like, that's the comp, right? But the difference was, I think those guys were 33 and 34 when those picks happened. Jared Goff's 28, right? So, like, it's not the same, right? You do have a guy that's that's in his his prime, and for whatever warts he has on his, his, his skill set or flaws to his game, like, he showed you last year he can he can put up top five passing numbers, and... um it's it's three seasons now out of the last six. Like he's he's a capable quarterback. In terms of after that six pick, I've been saying it for a while. I mean, I I really like the idea of Hendon Hooker as as a backup for this team, and um, kind of gives me some Jalen Hurts vibes in the sense that like that's a guy you could get early in the second round that's got accomplishments at a high level college program experience out the wazoo. Um, probably only have a chance at him because he's coming off an ACL injury and he's older. Uh, but in terms of a backup, like that is, that's a win for a backup to get a, get an experienced dual threat. You know, I like the, I like the ability to, to expend plays with your feet. Like that's, that's what I'd be looking at for the Lions is maybe using some of your assets and moving up in the second round and grabbing a guy Man, like that. I, it took what? 40 minutes or something. I finally strongly disagree with you on something. Okay. And it has nothing to do with an assessment on hooker. Yeah. I mean, guy was awesome. Obviously he went down with the ACL. I actually think he has a chance to be really good. So it has nothing to do with him, but aren't you just doing a diet Coke version of the same undermining of golf that you would be doing at six or 18? No. And, and this is, this goes back. I asked, it's actually almost the exact question I asked Holmes. I said, um, we know he thrives when he's supported. You've shown that support for him. You got the, you got the positive result. Is it contrary to supporting your quarterback to draft an heir, to draft a guy in the early in the first round? And Holmes said, as long as we're communicating with Goff about what our intent is, what we're doing and why we're doing it, then it's okay. Like as long as we're being honest, and open with our communication, which is a big thing with this regime from, from Holmes to Campbell to all the assistant coaches is, is just being direct and blunt and honest with these people. If you tell them we're drafting this guy to be your back, he's 20, 25, 26, whatever. Goff's 28. It's not like you're drafting the clear and obvious future. You're drafting a very solid and capable backup if Goff gets hurt. And, you know, 
Yeah. Um, I mean, you're, you're, it's an easy guy to clamor for. I know. For, it, yeah. You I, open I, up the talk I, radio waves for sure. For it's, sure. And you got, you have a sensitive quarterback. I mean, if, if my goal is yeah. to throw, I, I get what you're saying, but I don't know. I mean, Aaron Rodgers has done a lot more in his career overall for whatever you think of him than golf individually and has won a title. And I mean, he was the biggest baby about the Jordan Love thing. Now he's a baby about a lot of things. Maybe not the best example, but Jared Goff is not a guy. I, I want like the entire building. I, like I, I would almost have you as the backup quarterback, just so there's be no a bad decision. There's well, I mean, it, it's basically the same thing. If golf but goes on, they're fucked anyway. Mostly true, right? Like, how many backups are capable of stepping in and and keeping the franchise afloat? How many guys are capable of being Matt Castle on whatever year that was in New England? And I thought Ben Johnson had some really interesting comments down at the combine. He wants his Matt Moore. And I, I think a lot of people would scoff at that, right? That's not a golf replacement, Matt Moore. But you want a guy that's capable of stepping in and winning. Um, it's safer when it's a veteran. Yeah. It's safer when you bring in a guy like Case Keenum. Nobody's worried about Case Keenum usurping that starting job. Uh, but if you want to do it on the cheap and you want some guy with, uh, you know, maybe some potential as a trade asset or, you know, heaven forbid, a, a future starter down the road, you know, I think yeah, Hooker, Gardner Hooker might be the only guy. Yeah, like I, well, I love Gardner. Minshew is a good example. For That's sure. what you're talking about. Like yeah. no one thinks he's great, but yeah. if if your quarterback's out for four games, he can go two and two. But look at what these backup quarterbacks are getting paid this offseason. They're getting paid eight million, ten million a year. And I'm sorry, but if you're committing 32 to golf now, you can't you can't put another 10 million into the quarterback position to yeah. to as an insurance policy. So you have to consider either. Your your current situation, you're Nate Sudfeld for a million dollars, and know that yeah, you're you're screwed if golf goes down, or you you take the other low cost option and you you get a guy that's young and has some potential, and um, yeah, there there is some risk there with with chemistry and noise, if you will, in the background, but um, I don't. At some level, you have to trust your quarterback to be strong enough behind between the years to handle that. No, I mean, you're talking to the biggest golf fan. I probably like him more than his mom. And I don't trust him to, I don't want, I want him to just feel super good about himself. You know, Billy Bean pumping up Scott Hatterberg and Moneyball, you know, Scotty H picking machine. I just watched that for the first time. That's an awesome movie. I don't, I read the book. It's not even, oh, the, but yeah, Michael Lewis book's awesome. But uh, yeah, great movie. It's not even really a sports movie. It's awesome. Great, great movie. But that's what they need. They need to pump them up. And I think they get that. I don't, I'd be shocked. If they go anything in the first round, I'd be kind of surprised if even in the second round. After that, all bets are off. I and mean, yeah. why don't we call the 49ers scout that decided to take Brock Purdy with the last pick in the last year's draft? Maybe that'll work out. I mean, I would take Brock Purdy as the backup right now if he didn't have Tommy John surgery or whatever he had. I don't know. I, I, I'm a believer in what they're doing with Goff. This roster has some strengths for sure, but does have some holes that could so easily be addressed sure. with that pick. I'm willing to say, all the eggs in the golf basket. He's been healthy. He has no real track record of injury. He had a thumb thing that he played through. He missed like one game in LA. I'm in. Like, just ride with that. I want to supplement all up and down that roster, and that's what I'm rolling with. I do think Hooker will be a good player, but yeah, he, isn't he like a 26-year-old rookie, though? I think he'll be 26 some point in that rookie year. I'm, I'm off on that. All right. It doesn't matter. What? What do you what do you play? Four years? Who cares? He's still in his physical prime. Well, you're you're saying is it so? I talked to Brad Holmes. Is it so wrong to draft the heir if the incumbent's like 28? Yeah, it is. Yeah. If golf's 34, this is a different conversation. I don't want the noise. Jalen Hurts, Carson Wentz. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's fine. You were trying to push Wentz out. Wentz was coming. I don't think off, they were trying to push Wentz out. Wentz was horrible I after think, the. I mean, he was like borderline MVP the year he got hurt. They sure. won, but he was pretty bad after that, and he's been bad ever since. Yeah. Well, P yeah. Peter King said it was the biggest collapse since. he's ever seen, like in a career that he could mm -hmm. remember. That he just he did a show with, I think it was Florio. He was like, I can't recall anybody being like on high like that and then just being completely devalued. But that's another conversation. I think the, the quarterback's been addressed as a topic. I I don't think there's any meat on the bone i didn't think it last year this to me and it's a distant second to be clear but the second most intriguing conversation as it pertains to the lions particularly at six jalen carter. carter you knew where it was going i sure did you've waited on this i've waited on this on twitter i yeah. said he's off my board like i don't care yeah. i don't care if he's at 18 i'm not yeah. touching him i i just you're coming in you already have negative stuff around you you have all the yeah. incentive in the world to not report to your own pro day 
significantly overweight and out of shape. You haven't even gotten paid yet. Yeah. You have millions of reasons why I can make 5 million more if I'm 10 pounds lighter, potentially. Didn't do it. What's he going to do when the checks start coming in? I'm not, he might be a Hall of Famer. There have been guys with these red flags that ended up great. I'm not saying okay. he has no chance. I don't like the bet. Now, your article a few days ago now, I think, Ben, throw up the excerpt of Justin's article. I think you nailed it. And this is my sentiment as well in terms of the picture here. So this is you in the Detroit News a, a few days ago. Quote, with the way things are trending, Jalen Carter may be available for the Lions at six. As a player, Carter checks every box. He's a dominant interior force, earning the label of best talent in the draft from multiple pundits. But he might only be available Detroit, to Detroit because of red flags relating to his character. Carter appears to go against the culture established under Brad Holmes and Dan Campbell. That was my grounds for pulling him off the board. Yeah. Dan Campbell's quote on culture, Ben, throw that up, please, to give some context about what we're talking about. So this is Dan Campbell's asked, what kind of player is a Dan Campbell player? What are you looking for? This is Dan Campbell's response. Quote, just when you sit in there and you hear them talk about football, there's a fire burning in them, and they can't sit in their seat. They got to get up and talk. They got to tell you what's going on. You can't fake that. When you have that, you love ball and you'll eat and breathe it. Do anything for it and do anything for your teammates and you're uber competitive, end quote. He By the way, that's, that's one of those moments when you ask a question and you just get an answer and you just, you know, you ask the right question. Like Nailed you just it. see their l eyes light up. Like that, that's a win in this profession. Like, you're always working on ways to craft questions. And like when Dan answered that question at the combine, like it was like, that's a great did answer. Did you ask the question? Yeah. I didn't even know that. Yeah. I built it around St. Brown and, and Sewell. I did, I did not know you yeah. were the one that prompted. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm in, in the, uh, you know, the presence of greatness here. I'm not surprised. <laughs> I just didn't here. know that. But, but uh, even better. Because yeah. that's, a, I mean, it's a home run response. That's another reason why he's so likable. So he'll actually give you that if you give no him doubt. the proper prompt. So he was on Rich Eisen's show again today. And I mean, this is, I saw this like an hour before the show. So I didn't, we didn't prep anything. It makes one of us. I didn't but, see it. Well, but it was the same kind of thing. It, he went a little bit deeper. Rich Eisen asked him sort of the same question. Yeah. Like, what does it mean to be a Dan Campbell player? He said a lot of that same stuff. And, you know, it's about, there's no question about your dedication. And I'm like, Jalen Carter's off the draft board. I mean, he's off my draft board too. Yeah. But what, whether you agree or not, fans are like, "Oh, the, here's what they should do." You can have your opinion. I don't care. But if we're looking at reading the tea leaves, what we think he's going to do, I don't think there's a chance in the world they draft him. I don't care how far he falls. To me, my guess is he's off their board. I know there's no chance you know their board because nobody knows their board except them. But if you had to guess, do you think he's just not even up there on their board? Yeah, it's it's a complicated question in in regards to like. I don't spend a ton of time digging deep into prospects before they're drafted. Cause it's just, I don't have the bandwidth to it's I, I'm not a draft analyst, right? Like I'll, I'll do surface level understanding of as many prospects as I can, but like, I'm not digging into every little detail about Jalen Carter. So I'm, I'm left with the surface level stuff. Right. And so it starts with a car accident, you know, I, I've got to be careful here because I don't want to excuse what happened because it's awful and people died. But like at some level you look at that and you're like, all right, is that as somebody that was a 21 year old, a youthful transgression that ended in tragedy, right? Is that not reflective of who he is as a, as a human being? Can that be looked past? You know, and, and I don't know the answer to that, but that's a valid question for the organization to dig into. So that's the off-field character. Then you dip into the second part of character and you get into football character. You have the pro day. You have the showing up overweight, declining to do the, the drills, showing a lack of competitiveness that, that people look for. And that, that's why they, that's a big part of it. Yeah, they want to double check your measurables and, and compare it to what they think they see on film, but they want to see how competitive you are in terms of being the best in every single little thing you do. Then he goes to the position drills bombs them can't even finish just looks sloppy um out of condition uh funny coming from a guy that definitely couldn't get through him but um it's not my job right like that's that's well, his job no one's talking about paying you 40 million yeah. to do it so. i see a rick spielman video today former gm of the vikings brother of chris spielman talking about his concerns of carter watching his tape as he takes plays off 
like before before the the um, arrest warrants were issued at the combine, there was already buzz going around the combine that the Lions were not particularly keen on Jalen Carter. Just didn't like him. You know, didn't mean they wouldn't draft him, but yeah, there there was concerns there. I think those concerns have been magnified in all the wrong ways, you know, leading up to the process. So um, I've, I've said all along, I'd be very surprised if they draft him at six. I, I can't say that he is off their board per se. Like at some point there's, there's just a, there's a risk tolerance factor, right? That you just, you roll the dice. Um, there was another question I asked Campbell is, if you got a locker room strong enough, can you handle taking on one of those guys that you think maybe you can fix? And he said, yeah, you can have one in a locker room, maybe two. You know, I, I would argue right now that there might be one in that locker room already. I'm not going to, not going to throw that guy under the bus oh, right now, but man, come I on, know, it's a little aggressive. Can I get a side of the ball? At least you could, you could probably guess. Um, so I Carter, have, Carter might be two. And, and I, I think there's probably because all co- all coaches have an ego, right? That they can fix a guy, or they could be the guy that keep a guy controlled. But like, I don't know. I flash back to Titus Young, right? You had a great coach, a great position coach in Sean Jefferson that was pounding the table that he could keep Titus Young in line. Just some guys you can't. Yeah, I mean Titus Young was like diagnosed bipolar schizophrenic. Sure. So I mean that's a little. Di- he's he was like legitimately diagnosed mentally ill. Right. That's a little different. But I agree with you on the point, 100. percent But yeah. I a lot of those things cropped up in the pre-draft process. Oh, maybe it did. And yeah, there yeah. still was, there still was an element that we can handle it. And, you know, I'm sure scouting has changed a little bit more, but like yeah. at some points, like you just have to decide is, is this the right guy? Are we sending the right message to a locker room that we've built a certain way that we're willing to sacrifice it maybe for, to get a little bit better here when you can go a different route with it. And so I, I just, I'd be very surprised if Jalen Carter ends up a lion and, uh, that's going to piss some people off. You know, they want to see him taking the the asshole, if you will, the asshole that has talent. But oh, fuck that. There's assholes the, there's that are always competitive. That Kobe that. Bryant was an asshole, yeah. but he was competitive yeah. Yeah. To, to an extreme degree. People will point to Micah Parsons. You know, I think that's a, a, a comp. There was a lot of concerns about him, and he's gone on to become maybe the best defensive player in football. But like, Not, not motor concerns. But I don't think not yeah, out of shape concerns. There was not a motor concern. And I think yeah. that that matters maybe more than anything to Dan Campbell. Like he doesn't want a guy that's going to lollygag at any point in practice in a game. And this guy just, I don't know. He, it doesn't seem to have the competitive fire. You said what happens when he, I don't know what you said when uh, he gets the contract or maybe he has a conflict with a coach. Like, is he going to slough off? Like, is he going to become Nick Fairley 2.0? I think it's a, a legitimate concern. So, um, I'd, I'd be surprised. If he I, I mean, if you can't fake it for a couple months, it's why, really bad. I mean, I mean that's, yeah. that's that in itself is its own red flag. I think there's guys that are actually kind of bad guys and selfish and in it for themselves. And even those guys can well, but, Sue. button it up. Sue was that guy. Yeah. But the one thing I'll say, like, yeah, I agree with that. And that's Sue okay. Was, Sue was, also he was like so extraordinary. Pro, talented. Yeah. And he, he gave you, even if it was me first over team first, you got, everything from that guy yes yeah i didn't get it's a different thing and as far as like risk tolerance teddy shung was a second round pick out of boise Uh, my risk tolerance i'm willing to take the fucking cancer later i'm not going for the 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 cancer guy at pick six or i mean maybe even end of the first round especially if you're you have two first round picks like you know the lions do the difference is a 20 million dollar investment versus a four million dollar investment exactly it's just in your you're bypassing a lot less superior talent. You know, it's the drop off, yep. like the compromise is just not the same. So no, I'm with you. I, I like taking swings later. I'm not taking a swing at pick six. I'm not making, I'm not sacrificing. It's a big reason why. I mean, I thought Aiden Hutchinson was a hell of a player at Michigan anyway, yeah. but I really liked, I have no concerns about this guy. Like this, this, this guy like could, you know, do whatever he wanted. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll, I'll let him, cut. there's no curfew. Like he come, come on whenever you want, Aiden. Like yeah. if you're the dad, like I trust you. Man. And it's, it's not just Aiden. It's their two first round picks. Panay Sewell is that same guy. Like, you know, exactly what you're getting in him. You're getting a fiery, passionate, driven, clean football player. And so like, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for clean. And 
you know, obviously talent is part of that, but there's there's going to be talent there. So I don't know if it's going to be a cornerback or a defensive lineman. I think those are probably the two most likely positions, but they're looking for an Aiden Hutchinson or a Panay Sewell. Like just there's you can't question what they did. And again, I mean, Jalen Carter, I, I tweeted about it at the time. It was, I think it was during the college football playoff. Yeah, the first six quarters, he didn't do anything. He didn't do anything in the first game. And in the final, he was pretty much invisible in the entire first half. I think he made a couple plays in the second half of a game, by the way, that was already out of hand. <laughs> so it didn't really matter. But the guy is on the sideline, like in the second quarter, sucking the oxygen mask. Like he's, they, they had to like limit his reps. That's relatable for me, by the way. Yeah, but you're not, you're not in the conversation to be taken in the top five, six of an NFL draft. And you're also not 21 years old. Like if you're 21, I mean, when I was 21, and I was telling you I was a superior athlete, but in terms of like stamina, I could go out drinking all night and play pick up basketball four hours later because I like, took care of myself the other six days of the week. Jalen Carter is a million times the athlete of me. If I can like not be sucking air doing military style workouts and shit, it's, it's not like, I, I mean, that's embarrassing yeah. for a guy that talented. I agree. He could put in 5% of the effort of the average like you know, Jim, Jim boy, Jerry up yeah. at Michigan state working out, you know, five days a week working the bench press. Like it's just, he could give 5% of the effort and be at their level and he can't even get there. I'm out. Contrast that to Jordan Davis, his teammate from a year ago who had questions about his endurance and work ethic and then just put up one of the greatest combine performances we've ever seen. Like in just, yeah, I mean, I mean, I want to see his rep count higher, though. The guy played like 22% of their snaps this year. I agreed the combine for sure. Out a bunch. Hurt. But yes. No, no, I'm talking about when he played. Sure. Um, And, you know, everyone says, oh, they had the deepest defensive line rotation. True. Yeah. He also played the fewest snaps. But what I'm saying is like the the football character between two former teammates is just it's a just a different level yeah and i think jalen carter's i mean he's a more explosive talent that the raw i mean I, I, how do you show up to your job and it's like showing up to a job interview drunk right. it really is i mean because if your job is your body like your athletic abilities yeah how is that any different than someone showing up where if my brain is you know if i'm going for an accountant job yeah. it's it's literally like showing up drunk right i don't think that's unfair i'm just thinking of the stepbrother scene where they show up in the tuxedos oh but i think that was an upgrade over what jalen yeah. carter did i'm sorry like if your entire your pitch isn't how well you operate and navigate microsoft excel your whole pitch is like i'm an athlete i'm like i'm gonna be dedicated I, show up drunk it's the same thing it's like it's like us showing up drunk i i'm i hate when guys do that shit i'm, I'm out on him speaking of we buried him he's buried He's at number six, he's buried. If someone if someone wants to take him in the second round, fine. I don't touch him in the first round. I don't care if I'm picking 29th. I'm not in. No. Second round, if he if he had an all time plummet, maybe because he's he's probably is the most talented player in the draft. Your article stipulated, you know, there's, there's multiple people pundits. for sure. Yeah, and that, I've I've read the same sort of take on it. He probably is the most talented player in the draft. Certainly on that side of the ball, I'm just out. I have no interest in that. And. Even I would I would feel that way even if it were Patricia or Caldwell or Schwartz I would I'd be out anyway but especially for this coach yeah. and he's told he's basically told us he's not going to draft him that's in a roundabout way it's really it's like Dan Campbell's impossible he can't he can't lie so like it's really easy sometimes to read the tea leaves with him which is makes my job fun he's not taking him people people got to grow up with that just like the Jordan Davis at, at, with our first round pick last year the second overall pick it's absurd okay. Speaking of potential attitude problems, okay, I have a lot less conviction on this one. And when I say a lot less, I mean I basically have zero conviction because I don't know. But it is an objective truth that there is buzz of some kind in the negative direction for Jameson Williams. Hmm. I don't know if there's any merit to it. That's yeah. why I'm asking you. I, there was all this response to his you know, post-draft this guy that he looked disengaged he looked mad and even he kind of laughed about it afterwards i was mad uh, you know. so I, I just there's some concern there the other little sparkle though and i, I didn't care about the post draft stuff there was a, a comment from brad holmes yeah you know what i'm talking about yeah. where he you know he's saying he, we he's got we got to make sure he's all in or something like that I'm, i didn't yeah. pull the quote it was not holding up his end of the bargain yeah yeah, yeah. like he's got to do his job hold up his end of the bargain that's not something you say about a guy that's the first in, last out. I mean, yeah. I, it's, it was a little bit of a, not an indictment, but 
a curiosity tossed into the water. Where are you at on this? I mean, you cover this team. You've been in the building with the guy. Like, what's his affect? Like, is is does he mope around? Like, what's the what's your read on him? I I don't think in my twelve years of doing this, there's a player I've related to less. I mean, just I, no one's made me feel as old as Jamison Williams. Maybe that's the best way to put it. Like, I look at his Instagram and I I see the way he talks and interacts people. Like, it just like it's like a different generation and it's not, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, I feel old, you know? Um, I didn't read into Brad Holmes's comments the way a lot of people did. I, I thought it was kind of a boilerplate cliche from him. Like, well, we expect big things, but he's got to work too. Like basically just saying nothing's going to be handed to anybody. Like it's, it's just another way of saying it to me. Um, I I did think probably the the strangest thing I thought that was said about Jameson last year came from Ben Johnson, who says very very little. Once like he was good in training camp, and then the season came and like the he turned off, like he just didn't say anything. But he said something late in the season of like uh, something along the lines that we thought maybe he'd be further ahead than he was since he's been back, and he's he's just not there yet. Um, some guys are are slow on some things, and that's that's okay, but um. I think the Marvin Jones signing had some play here. Not a lot of people are talking about it, but Marvin Jones is of the highest character in terms of person uh, with how he you know handles his family business and uh, but also football. He is that first guy in last guy out and goes through every drill a hundred percent. And I think that, they want to surround J and I'm not saying DJ Chark wasn't, but um, you know, just, I think they want to surround Jamison Williams with examples of guys that are professionals. You hear that a lot with young players. I had to learn how to be a professional. Um, it's almost universal with, with guys. And uh, Jamison is a very laid back nonchalant guy. I think just in general, like he's just, Super cool, super laid back, and I think uh, when he gets on the field, that fire shows, but I think they're trying to get a little bit more of that fire out of him on a day-to-day basis, a uh, fire about his profession, about being the best, because you know some guys just they have so much natural talent that there's this natural inclination to coast on it because you could coast on it every other level until you get to the NFL, and so... Um, you know, I, I do, I think there was value in bringing in Marvin Jones to, to give Jamison another mentor by osmosis, if you will. It's not, not a blunt, you got to follow this guy and do everything. He's just, just by being around him, having that rub off, I think is going to be valuable for him. But, um, I don't know. I, I don't have any broad or bold proclamations about Jamison. I, I don't feel like I've seen enough of him. I feel like they certainly didn't use him in an expansive way last year. I thought it was a very limited uh, usage, but you know, it sounds like some of that at least was on him. Uh, I, I'm going to have more, I think, to say on Jamison after his second training camp, when he has actually his first training camp, right? When he's got a full off season, that's when I think we'll get to see what he's really about. Cause I don't think we know right now, but it would be weird because it would be so out of character because Brett Holmes has not missed in, in that regard, right? To, to trade up 20 spots for a guy who like is the ultimate conviction. Like you went up to get this guy, you paid a huge price to get this guy. They love his tape. And so I'd be surprised if they, they missed on the bigger picture of what this guy is about. I mean, to me, he was probably the best offensive player in that draft. I mean, like if you're taking the injury away, if, sure. if the injury just doesn't happen in the college football playoff game, I loved him in college. He was just impossible to cover. You felt like he was always open, great hands, kind of everything you want. You'd like him to be a little bit bigger just for hit endurance, but there's plenty of you know, Tyreek Hill's compact that he does fine. Like sure. it's, it's not a deal breaker. It's Devontae Smith. like Yeah. Oh, I mean, that's a, it's another even string more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. He, he, he makes uh, those guys look obese by comparison. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I still like the kid. I just, I don't like hearing that you haven't proven 
jacked shit yet and we're already getting this like oh he's got to we got to bring in a mentor to show him the way i just i, I it's a little bit of a, a post draft red yeah. flag it's I not mean, a write off though sure i mean some guys don't need to be showed that we would go back to hutchinson right I, something he said to me last year is like i've been training as a professional since i got to college like some guys just have that mentality right like you want to say they got the dog in them or whatever, how you want to say it, but like just they attack every day with, with this professional seriousness. And um, a lot of guys don't. And again, it's, these are 20, 21 year old kids. Like uh, sometimes you just, you have to be around it. And obviously he played for Nick Saban and there was probably very high demands at Alabama, maybe higher than any college program from like a professional operational standpoint. But um, you know, it's it's just a different thing when you're going from college to the NFL where it's 100% your job. That's the only thing you have to worry about is football. Do you think they would take him again and do what they did trading up for him again? That's a good question. I, you don't sense any buyer's remorse there? No. I, I, they just I, don't I seem haven't thought about it. They seem, I'm a tea leaf guy too. Like yeah. they don't, they're not indicting him, but I can see how much they like Aiden Hutchinson Yeah, when they talk about him. I don't get the sense that they dislike Jameson, but I, there's not that like robust. Oh man, like he's one of a, like. Yeah. There's a little bit of he's got to catch up, and it doesn't mean he can't. Like he's not. Yeah. He doesn't seem like a bad kid. It just seems like there there's a little bit of wanting there on their end. Yeah. I'm not around. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, when you draft a a prospect, you expect development, right? Like you expect development. And maybe that development's just not limited to on field. Sometimes that development is as a person or with maturity and. um I don't know. I was a very different person from the age of 20 to the age of 25. Um, and I didn't have millions of dollars in my bank account. Like, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I guess I just don't want to judge the kid without seeing more, right? Like he just, that rookie season was like a red shirt year in a lot of ways. It wasn't, I mean, he obviously got in there a little bit at the end, but, um, I, I just don't know what he's about yet. I really don't. I mean, I've talked to him and, um, like I said, there's a there's a personality disconnect that I've I've got with him that I I just can't even think of another player that I've had that with. Like it's it's weird, but um, I don't know. It's 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 a tough one for me to get a read on right now. Well, no one had to decide whether or not to pick up your fifth year option when you were turning 25, though. That's the difference. It's like yeah. we don't have we don't have time to wait until you're 25. Well, you got you got three years. No, well, I'm not saying it has to happen right now, yeah. but. Better happen pretty soon. Yeah. I mean, it's like the same thing, and we'll finish with Akuda in a second. But it's the same with the Akuda thing. Like we were in year three, or going into year three, and people are telling me, "Oh, he still has time to justify the position." Yeah. No, he doesn't. Even if he's great in year three, like he had to be great on day one. Like, and so the James now Jameson's different because everyone knew going in. The only reason you even got him at that spot, you know, even trading up for him is because of the injury. I mean, right. he was going to go like top six, seven. So it's a little bit different, but I in the business of sitting around and waiting in the NFL. Like this is not a this is not baseball where guys pop when they're twenty six. I mean you're you're in or you're out at that. At that know, point. You just signed a cornerback for three years for thirty three million that took four years to start. Like it happens, yeah. guys. What round was he taking it? No, well, that's fine. He wasn't making anything. Yeah. I'm willing to. It's like you with Darius Slay when we were talking about Akuda. Oh, Slay wasn't great as a rookie year either. For one, he was a lot better than Akuda was. So he was a second round pick. He wasn't the highest drafted corner right. in 30 years. Yeah, it's like our 25 years. It's it's you can't. You, it's apples to oranges. Like Jamison Williams, you traded up. What was he? The 12th pick. 12th. Right before Jordan Davis at 13. I need you to ball, man. And obviously he was hurt. I'm not talking right. about last year. Going forward. And you know what? Receivers, I can kind of get away with a jackass wide receiver, like a little bit. Of, I'm not saying he's a jackass, yeah. but as a general matter, there's a lot of jackass receivers that have gone on to have great careers and win big things. So it's not the same as like a quarterback. I don't want a quarterback jackass. I need my quarterback buttoned up. So there is some tolerance for some nonsense, but I'm just, I'm not even saying there is a problem. I'm just, there's some stuff there that I would say is a departure from the ideal. I'd rather have them seem very happy about him like they are with Hutchinson. It's just, I, I had some concern there from afar. I, we'll see what happens because I think most people agree he's the biggest X factor. Like, I mean, this team was the, you know, depending on what metrics, fourth or best, fourth or fifth best offense in the NFL last year with him basically. I mean, he wasn't even there and then he was almost a nothing. If he's the best receiver in last year's draft, like a lot of people thought, what do you have? Right. 
it's kind of, and uh, I agree with you, upgraded running back. Everyone was, oh, it's, uh, like, no, so it's, up, it's an upgrade. It's a clear upgrade, but also I love how quickly he stomped, uh, Charles stomped on the Lions, like out his way out the door. It's, everyone thought it's a fake endearing. Uh, they didn't bought that Some shit. guys, some guys need that though. They need, they need the chip on the shoulder, the chip on the shoulder. They need the motivation of being uh, ignored or slighted and, that that's who he is. I mean, you remember when he got here with the Green Bay talking about his ex girlfriend. That's okay. Like if that's what motivates you, if that's what fuels you, if it works, so I'm not be saying it. I have a problem yeah. with it. I'm just saying I never bought like he really he loves us. It's like no, he's fired up to, to to stick it to Green Bay, which I don't have any problem with. But that's what that was. There was no genuine love for Detroit. Doesn't mean he hated Detroit, but that that he was the most like overrated. And I liked him. He had a good year. Touchdowns is like pitcher wins i mean it's such a factor of circumstance you give half the running backs in this league a thousand carries at the two yard line they're gonna I'd say it's the ability to drive in a run from third base right like most of the work is done you still got to do something uh, yeah, sure i think it's even yeah. less impressive than that because like a hit's a hit like a run like plunge falling forward for a yard i mean what what was like his long touchdown i mean maybe he broke one they were all like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think of the 17, like 14 or whatever, were two I, yards. It was a nice year, but people yeah, were like, great, yeah. how can you let the touchdown? It's like, come on. Like, it was a nice year, but yeah. that has no bearing. Like, touchdowns, get out of here with that, right? Plunging in from the one. Okay, Tebow could have done that. Tebow would have scored most of those. All right. Real quick on Akuda, and then I'll get you yeah. out of here. It's been a long day for you. I, I do want to get your sort of end of thing prediction. A long day disc golfing, let's be clear. Long day's a long yeah, day. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not enjoying, saying, you're, I'm not saying you were in the coal mines, but yeah. I mean, you, had, you know, hours on the body yeah. or hours on the body. I, I got in the mud and I, I, you know, I keep promising myself that I won't do it. And I keep doing it I, in the mud with these pride of Detroit guys. And I'm not asking you to comment on them because you probably don't even know who they are. I like Jeremy. These get, well, it's not, it's not Jeremy I'm talking oh, about. This, well. this Ryan guy. I don't even know his last name. I don't know. I don't know if his last name is public. Okay. He's driving me nuts and it's not his fault. It's my fault because this guy It is any engagement in social media that goes beyond one tweet is a hundred percent your fault. So good. Oh, I'm good that. self-awareness. Yeah. Oh, oh it's, it's, yeah. I'm completely self-aware. Yeah. I have many flaws. Yeah. Lack of self-awareness actually is not one of them. It's one of the few things I have dialed in. I'm, I'm a fool for getting into it, but the guy is driving me crazy. Okay. And it's if he were an isolated case, the reason he's I'm trying to take his side, by the way, I don't even know what the point is, but I'm going to. Doesn't take matter. Side. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I could say anything. And you're like, hey, uh, I'm Team Ryan on that one. Yeah, and I think you probably will be Team Ryan on this one because I yeah. kind of know your predisposition on this topic. Yeah, but these people are telling me that the sky is purple when it's blue. I I can't take it anymore, and he's just one. It's not. It's like if it were just him, throw him in the bin of crazies whatever it's yeah. actually like a prominent detroit lions fan opinion to the point where i feel like i'm being gaslit and i actually care somewhat about the historical record in detroit sports probably care a little bit too much because it doesn't matter but i care i want it in stone right now from the guy that i think is the best detroit lions right in stone yeah you got, you got a chisel yeah jeff akuda yeah was a bust and they never should have taken him is that fair I say jury is out, bust. It's on the wall. I'm going to print that in <laughs> this, high def. This graphic. He, he, his, look at his Did face. Did Ben make this graphic? He, well, it was. This a, does not seem like Ben quality. It work. was my. This looks like clip art. Ben made it, but I dictated it. Ben, ben does so much good work. I did not believe he did this. He did, but I told him what to do, and I told him to keep it like really simple. So oh. it's mostly my fault, even though he pressed the buttons. Yes, but that to me, I, I can't believe this is a discussion. Yeah, he was bad before mm -hmm. the injury, which kind of matters when you're the highest drafted corner since mm -hmm. Sean Springs in '97. You, if you're making that pick, he's got to be good on day one. I don't want to hear this developmental. Oh, give him time shit. Uh, my ass. That you didn't draft him third overall for to, to wait around for production. The other thing is, hey, injuries can be part of the equation with a bust thing anyway. So I got a guy that couldn't play at all. I mean, at all. You got mad at me for the Tease Tabor comparison. The guy's PFF. Oh, was dumb, so. He was worse. The, or, no, sorry, he was three points better. But negligible difference. Tabor was like 29.8. 
and Okuda was 32.2. Slay, you're like, oh, Slay's rookie year. So remember how big of a mess he was? It was a mess. He was like a 54 PFF. He was like 20 points higher than Okuda. And you're saying what a mess that was for a second round pick as a rookie. I, the point is the data, I can only deal with what I have. Sure. He was horrible. Okay. And they had a bunch of injuries. They should have never taken him to begin with because yep. I wouldn't take any corner at that spot. Yep. Maybe if you have like a, you know, Deion Sanders where the guy's running up the brick wall, like Bo Jackson type, like maybe I can get there. I Probably not, but maybe depending on what else is out there. This guy was not that. He was a great college corner, no question. He was not a truly transcendent, although he was represented as one corner. Yep. Please tell me that I'm not insane. Please don't gaslight me like Ryan pod is gaslighting people he was yelling at me two years ago you watch he's gonna vindicate my position he's gonna earn that third overall pick status you just watch you know I, i'm keeping the receipts asshole and then i come and i, I come for my mea culpa i want a basket yeah. from the guy you brought the receipts well i didn't even need to bring them i mean i commented in the thread that was relevant so yeah in a sense i did but i did all you, i wanted did you dig up a two-year-old thread yes oh you are a bad person <laughs> Bad person. You. He owes me. Yeah. He owes me that. I thought you said you were self aware, and you're digging up two year old Twitter threads. No, no, no. I'm. No. How is that a lack of self awareness? I'm aware how stupid it is. I admitted that stupid. I'm just saying I still believe stupid or not. Here, here's my position. There's, there's. there's this there's, is a bigger bust than anything. Big. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. Well, you're going after a blogger. No, no, no. no. I'm going oh, two years after hold the on, fact. Calm down. I'm not. He <laughs> he down. is he is like. I'm the, sorry. Am I digging up two year old tweets now? He no. is the he is the embodiment of that position. Okay. He 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 is like the vessel. I'm attacking the vessel. If this were some fringe opinion that like two people had, I would leave it alone. But sorry, I mean they don't have as big a following as you know you and I yeah. do. Not everyone's that cool. But the guy does have a solid following. People read this stuff, and you're dumbing down the populace. I don't want to be at the bar. I don't want to be at Mr. B's and overhear someone saying, oh, you know, I think Akuda, it wasn't so bad after all. It was bad when they did it, and everything said against it was vindicated. Sure, there were injuries. He sucked before him. Uh, and again, injuries can be part of the equation that labels you a bust. I mean, long story short, can we just get the answer out of you? True or false, he was a bust. I have no problem with somebody using the bust label. I don't. Take that, Ryan. But I, I think that there are mitigating circumstances. It's not a, I, again, I'm not a black and white guy. I'm a shades of gray guy. It's just how I am. I think there were factors in there that contributed to bust. I think that injuries are outside of guys' control sometimes. I don't think that you should hold injuries they shouldn't play a huge part of the equation. You say they shouldn't have drafted him anyway. I think that we look at the scenario that was happening there. It was two guys trying to save their jobs. They thought they were going to grab the most NFL ready prospect that could help them save 100%. their jobs. That's why it happened. Uh, blew an opportunity. I think to get a young quarterback at that time, probably would have been two over Herbert, which would have been the wrong decision. And we'd be talking about that now. Who else did they miss? I was a two a guy. Yeah. Well, that's Oops. fine. That's fine. What? I mean, again, Injuries, because yep. you have predicted the concussions. Probably not. Two of his numbers are pretty damn good when he's I know, healthy. But yeah. like, it, you're looking at maybe Job at best 2.0. Two of his injuries actually were not unforeseeable. That's, well, he had the really bad hip or yeah, leg, hip but issue. like the concussions have really been the That's the messed different, up. but people were worried about him being brittle generally. It sure. wasn't just the hip. It's so he's small. What is the other alternative option to jeff okuda it was Derek brown right like that was the other guy so now you're talking about a defensive tackle who was pedestrian at best his first two pretty damn good in year three but you'd say after two years at number three pick well that was a waste of pick too so like they did what they thought was best for the franchise at the time uh -uh, uh -uh. no 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 they did what they thought was, was best, best for them. for them correct good correction Fair correction. Oh my God, that's a. a it's a fair time. correction. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it was so, for them. For them. Self preservation. Yep. Injury struck in training camp. His rookie year. It it's not an excuse, but it is a partial explanation for why there was struggles as a rookie year. It happened year two. It's off the table. He got hurt. We don't even know. 
We don't know. He played a half a game. I thought torched in the preseason. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Do you do you do I you agree. complain about a pitcher that gets lit up in spring training? No, no. But if I but I presume I'm gonna have some other data from which to work. I can only work it's a with a brand what I new have. coaching staff, it's a brand new oh. scheme. Like none of that matters. The preseason to get out of here with your preseason. I'm argument. not a preseason guy, but it's not my fault the guy collapsed on it. the field. You uh, said it. Yeah, I said it because it's all I have to work Irrelevant. with. Irrelevant. So you'd rather you'd rather I base it on nothing at all. Year two, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Year all three right. comes back. Comes back. He has some moments. Number three moments? No. No, but he was coming back from an Achilles injury. I think, and I said this before, I think it speaks to the football character how driven he was. And if you saw this guy on the practice field before he was cleared with how we, we, a couple of us were talking about, like, he's going to hurt himself again. He's going so hard. Like, just sweat pouring off. Of, like, that guy went hard to get back on this football field for this team, for himself. Like, highest amount of respect for him. I think he had some really great moments. The week three Minnesota game against Justin Jefferson. Yeah, he had help, but they held Justin Jefferson at 14 yards and Jeff Fakuda was the guy on him that entire game. The Dallas game I thought was a remarkable example of a player doing what was asked of him, going out 15 tackles, playing in the box, showing no fear and just smashing the running back over and over and over again. It didn't work out. It didn't work out. And that was a number three pick. You got 22 games. You got two interceptions. You got a number two cornerback production in year three. It's not a number three pick. So if you want to say bust, I'm okay with that. It doesn't offend me. I, I, you it know. offends them. Well, who cares? It's well, your I, opinion. I, well, I know, but the, they owed they owed me the the little you know. Okay. Well, oops. Since we're going back, since we're going back to yeah. old opinions. Yes. September first. 2021. I'm ready. What, what did I say? Justin Spiro DM me. He was very excited. What you I know say? this guy? Uh, his phone-in segment to the Valenti show about Panay Sewell's awful week one performance and how he was tracking towards being a bust. Wait, wait, I need the exact quote. Don't paraphrase. It is way too early to panic about Panay Sewell. But okay, it is a bu- it, ah, blah, 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 it. But it is a bummer. We are reminding ourselves to be patient with another top draft pick. Stand After one game. I stand by it. Here, the argument it is... It was a bummer that you had it, to be patient for one game? It's this... Well, and he looked bad in the preseason. His... The Jesus, argument... Jesus, stop. The, the preseason. The argument... No, that, 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 that was the worst gotcha in the history of gotchas. I stand by, I stand by that now. <laughs> All I said there was that it's a bummer, and I said the same thing actually with the Tigers. It's like, oh, it's too early to write off Torkelson. It's too early to write off Green. It's like... I agree. I'm not writing them off. Can I have one of these guys come in and be good on the first day? That was what that's about. Why I stand by to be that. a day one. Panay Sewell probably had one off. of the best rookie seasons you can imagine yeah, for a 20 year old offensive tackle. Yeah, it's great. But you're like, you just were jumping to the bus label already. I didn't jump on shit. I said it was a bummer. All I, and I, I stand by it's a bummer that it's a yet another guy that we're saying, oh, they look bad, but it's early. All I was saying is from a, a, a traumatized fan standpoint, and it's the same thing with the Tigers. I don't want to have to convince myself it's still early. It's still early with literally God, everybody. I hope this number six pick puts an all-pro performance out. So TJ Hawkinson okay, was the greatest the debut th- of all time for you. Remember there were some people worried about Hutchinson based on a couple like individual whiffs in the backfield? Maybe you had a rough start. But even that, I disagree that it was – like an at large rough start. He had bad moments. I also thought he was very good in other moments. I, I saw enough there that I wasn't worried about it. So I was the opposite on Hutchinson. I was calling out people Such like me. Michigan Homer. Yeah, right. I you'd be surprised. Michigan State fans were like mad at me that I was so pro Hutchinson. That sounds before. right. They were they were like, yeah. uh, oh yeah, kind of the Patricia get off your knees thing to uh was that Slay, right? Or was that Oh, was Slay. that Glover Quinn? I can't even remember. Yeah. He was yelling at everybody. Uh, yeah, it was Slay. It was like the why he's sucking his dick or whatever it was. I can't even remember. Who was that? Like, I, he was, it was about a specific corner or something on Instagram. It doesn't matter. But I, I stand by the sentiment of, as a Detroit sports fan who has seen all four of these teams be horrible yeah. for the better part of a decade now. Like, literally, I mean, it was the last good it's thing that bad. happened. Yep. Like, 2014 when the Lions, I, I mean, I have to think. I think the Wings... 
playoff streak ended right around like a year or two later. It's pretty much college basketball. Pistons haven't won a playoff else. series since 08. I, it's been bad. Yep. Tigers, you know, obviously went to the World Series in 12 and, you know, were kind of good a couple years after, but, you know, 13, they had the best team in the league. But it's been bad. I'm not challenging your my only, It's been a bad decade. My only point was, and I, st- I stand by that, I'm sick of every single guy that we love coming in leads to this discussion of, oh, my God, is this guy actually good? And that's not a universal fact that every rookie struggles. They don't. Mm-hmm. Micah Parsons was jumping off the page the first day he stepped foot in that facility in Dallas. Yeah. They were raving about him. And I mean, week one, the guy was blowing everybody up. Yeah. I just wanted one guy that doesn't make me have to say. Even Hutchinson, I could, although I was you got, defending you him. You got your week one awesome performance from TJ Hawkinson. And then he was TJ Hawkinson. I, I don't so show some patience and get, maybe you get a Panay Sewell once in a while. I liked, I was in favor of the Sewell pick. This is, you're, you're, this, I, this is unfair. I, I'm oh, yeah? like Jared Goff being unfairly maligned, but I don't get paid $30 million to do it. I, I, I like Sewell. And I, that was not a gotcha. If you want to do the gotcha stuff, pull me mocking the idea of the Lions winning more than six and a half games last year. That was my worst take in like five Ooh. years. I said, oh, you probably feel pretty good after week seven. The though. worst part, what I was just going to double down the worst. I did not double. Out. I actually didn't even bet it. Cause I, I, you just retweeted yourself. I retweet myself when I win. Um, <laughs> but I was, that very, is, that is the most accurate statement. <laughs> I don't ever hear from your losses. I was very transparent about the Dan Gamble thing, but I, I didn't always say, Oh, my prediction is they're not going to, you know, go over the six and a half. I openly said it was the best bet on the entire board in either direction over or under, under six and a half. And the bigger mistake, because anybody can be wrong, was the premature celebration. I was like dancing. I was like retweeting, quote tweeting, dunking on everyone that was yelling at me. And it, it, they cleared it by like basically three games. <laughs> it wasn't even cl- like, I, you know, maybe if they like got hot and won seven, like, It'd be wrong, but it wouldn't be embarrassingly wrong. Nine, when you're like, they have no chance to win seven, was bad. So if you that was a fair criticism. But I will say in my defense, Brad Holmes... I was not, actually more criticizing you for wasting your time calling into talk radio, but whatever. Well, that's valid. Well, especially now, but Rico yeah. hangs up on me now. You know, Rico doesn't like me all that much. That's that's sort of the, the word on the street. I hang up on you most of the time. Well, you, you took my call this time. I mean, but yeah. Mistake. The difference is, I mean, Rico probably has a little more reason not to like me. All I do is sing your praises, and you, you, you still, you know, treat me with the bare minimum of, you know, patience and it's politeness. R- Rico probably has an understandable reason for not liking me. To be fair, this is not a therapy session. I, I think yeah. billable hours, man. Move, I was going to hit move. you up for it. Let's go to the next topic on the rapid fire questions. The, well, the next topic is finishing here. What's the record this year? We're making fun of my mm. six and a half last year. I mean, what's the record? Mm. You're going to do your column. I know it's coming after. Oh, no, I do not do the predictions. You do. Did you not do a like game by game? Like, Never. Oh, man, I got you mixed up with someone then. It was one, one of the other else. beat writers. Bur- maybe it was Burkett. Yeah. Someone did like a predicting every game or whatever. Yeah. I, they, thought it was I think they make me give like a, a number right before the season starts. What but is that number going like to be? Uh, if, uh, the, the draft's going to happen. Question. We, we know that. Question. We know what's going to change. But if you had to guess right now. Is the, is this team going to win the division? How about that? We can keep it to that. I think the odds that you started this program with were accurate. I think I've always said I'm not betting against Aaron Rodgers when he's in this division. I he's not in this division. He's either going to retire, he's going to play for the Jets, he's going to play for the Jets. Uh the Vikings were fraudulent to a degree last year. Yes. Ton of one-score wins. Good teams win one score games, but that's not sustainable to do that over and over and over again. I I don't know how the Bears spending spree is going to turn out. Generally, those things don't turn out well. But you know, this is a new GM's first time going crazy in the spending. Uh, let's let's see how it plays out. But they were they were a step behind the Lions on the rebuild process, right? So I think that. Ten and a half is maybe where we should set a line. It's what it's the ex, it's the expectation you should have for this football team. Will it happen? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, Jared Goff could get hurt in week two, and that prediction's stupid, right? But you, just like Dan Campbell was saying, you should expect this team to win the division. That is the bar this year, and that's the bare minimum bar. And if you win the division, then you host a playoff game. 
and the home team wins more often than not. So maybe the expectation should be winning a playoff game. And that's, that's I guess, a nice, realistic expectation to have. When's the last time we said that? I Ever? have not seen them host a playoff game in my lifetime. I, that will be... Weren't born in 91? Well, How old were you? I was 10. How old I, were you? would have been beginning so i was not i had not even turned four yet yeah so yeah yeah i mean no it, memories it, no memories to me that doesn't game. count like, i guess I was, 90 93 they hosted one right did they host in 93? they won they won the division in 93 was thought, that philly that just I came in here 91 was the last team division one. was it 93? that was the last playoff win but i think they won the division in 93 okay was that yeah. the they got definitely the last playoff win was 91 i'm positive yeah, of that 100 um because then they got blasted in the <laughs> next game i yeah i i I, I just think, think Philly was 97, 98, it, something like that. It would be the best thing ever just to host that game. Like sure. The, the that buzz stadium, in that city and the, the, the I noise. I mean, you've been to games at the Silverdome. You've been to games at Ford Field. Like, this fan base is good. That's and, awesome. And that stadium is conducive to noise. I, you know, I always reference the Monday Night Football game against the Bears, Javid Bass, 90 yard touchdown run. They, I think they moved to 5 0 with that win in 2011. It's the only time I've ever left a stadium in a working capacity where my ears were ringing for hours after, like ringing. Like that place was, they were hanging from the rafters. And so to think they couldn't recreate that environment, pack it in there with standing room only, breaking attendance records for a playoff game is foolish. Like it will be crazy, crazy. Like this, this fan base is so hungry and they're, long suffering i mean they deserve something good to happen to them for once because they because because they've stuck with it foolish or not you know i think probably plenty of times where you could say why are you wasting your money why are you wasting your time why are you not going to the cider mill with your family on sundays instead of running yourself through a mental ringer here but um they stuck with it and um you know looks like good things are on the way and you know enjoy it lions fans there's a little bit of a Cubs fan thing for me, selfishly, because I yeah. mean, my my dad is you know entering now his mid seventies, uh, will be turning seventy three this year, and I mean he's become cynical, like he, he doesn't you know sit and weep in the pillow when they lose. He's kind of like oh there it goes again. But he's been a Lions fan his whole life. Yeah, he, yeah he's cynicism ne- is deserved. Uh, but he's never he's never seen him do anything. It's just you know they were they were good in the fifties. Same kind of thing as like when he was five years old. He doesn't remember that shit. He's right. been the season ticket holder for you still. He gave up the Tigers. He gave he had all the teams. He gave them all up. He kept the Lions. Now part of it is there's fewer games, but he he did not want to give up the Lions. Yeah. And it was the one team he kept. And it's like, you know, there's a little bit of I want to see like them win for my dad too. Sure. He's, and he's you are whole life. You are one of thousands of guys yeah. that, that share that for their dad, for their grandpa. Um you I feel know he, that mortality. I know he wasn't a fan, but like you know, the the time Jerry Green invested into following the Lions and being an encyclopedic reference of this franchise, like to go to all those Super Bowls and to never see like the hometown team do it. Like it's not that he was rooting for it, but it's just like the guy didn't get to see it. That's kind of weird. Yeah, I, it's not about rooting for it. It's, you know, I think it was James Edwards I was talking to on the show because the Pistons were in the middle of sucking as they still are. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I mean, I don't root for them, but it's more fun when they're good. Like, it'd be more fun if they were better. Same yeah, thing. like, it's... Covering a really bad team can be interesting, but covering a really bad team year after year after year after year after year after year, it gets exhausting, like, mentally exhausting. Like, it's 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 a Groundhog's Day element, right? And, like, it... Um, it's not my proudest fact, but like I, I frequently would like, you know, just ask people around the facility, like, is it week 17 yet? Like it's week six, but they're like, they're one in five. And it's like, I just, I can't cover, I don't know, I, one of the worst columns I ever had to write, but they, they were playing Arizona or Buffalo or something. And they were two terrible teams. I was like, it was basically like, go to the cider mill. Don't watch this football game. It's awful. These teams are awful stop wasting your time on this product like it's it's just nice to cover something different and positive and um i don't know i guess maybe it's a weird thing to say but like it's good people doing it if that makes sense like dan campbell's 
a good dude to work with. Like it's, it's a really easy working relationship to know that I can go in there and ask the questions, however tough I want to ask them. And 95% of the time I'm going to get an answer. Um, like that's, I think there's a reason why there's this national appeal and everybody's excited about the lines is because the people that are at the top of this organization are interesting and engaging and likable. Like there's a reason that, all these people want to see these guys succeed is because they're, they're a likable team. Not, I mean, not lovable losers, but likable team that it, for sure. I mean, I said before Campbell's first game in year one, I've never rooted for a coach more like on a like individual level, obviously like anybody that's coaching Michigan state football or basketball, I root for harder sure. just by virtue of the position. But in terms of like rooting for the guy, I, I mean, it's like, him and Tom Izzo to get the second national title. It's like neck and neck. I mean, he's just such a awesome, genuine guy. Genuine is the word, right? Yeah. Like when you watch the videos, I, I think it was happening during COVID if I remember correctly, but when he was getting hired, like you could feel his awe of, of being in the position, like just getting the opportunity that he'd been working so hard for. And it, you know, like I said earlier, like getting it here, like I think it really does matter to him that it's, here. I'm sure there's a couple other places that hold significance for him, New Orleans and Dallas probably just growing up there, but like um to to have the opportunity to to lead this franchise that's suffered this long and and to maybe be the guy cuz that's what every coach that comes here thinks they're going to be the guy that that leads them out of their um their misery like Marinelli you know, was Marinelli actually them. embraced all it. of them. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. Matt Patricia thought he was going to do it because that's what they do. They think they can do it and it's it's hard. It's so it's so hard swimming against the current of history here. Like he, they always talk about changing culture, right? And it's such a buzzy term, but like part of that is like changing the mindset of being a loser, you know. And I, I don't exactly know how Campbell found the right formula in two years, uh, but. I think the proof is really in the pudding. Like I do not, the, the confidence that comes out of that locker room is something that I've never seen. You know, it's just, there, there's a swagger there throughout that roster and some of the guys they put in there, but you saw in the way they won last year, like this is, this is a good football team and, you know, fans have every right to be as excited as they are right now. This is not, it's not fake. I agree with you that they're the rightful favorite. Like I would install them as the favorite. Yeah. They deserve to be the favorite. I have that little piece of me. I don't think it's unfair. I've never you seen can't it. shake it. It's always going to be there. I've never seen them do it. You, it's not like a, oh they're the you know San Jose Sharks and they usually get upset, but they went to the finals. You know, yeah. It's not like they've never even done that. Right. I've never seen them win a playoff game or a division. I was you know barely out of diapers. So. That component is to me, it just has me guarded. And, and you know, my some of my friends are saying, "Oh, come on!" Nope. And for as much as we celebrated the last year, nine and eight didn't make the playoffs and win the division. Now it would have been absurd if they had done any of those things. Right. But so I'm not saying that was the expectation. They exceeded expectations, even nine. But I still haven't seen them do it. And I don't right. think like why? Why is the cynic the asshole? for saying like, Hey, can I see it happen once? I, I don't know. It's what all I, in how you but, present that, right? Like it's okay to be cynical. If you haven't seen something happen, why should you believe it? But like, I, I think there's also like, you don't have to shit on the optimist, right? Like I'm not I know, shitting. I know yeah, that there's yeah. the, the guy that's always hyper optimistic about the lines every season. That's like, it's, it's like the hyper negative guy. You just, you have to ignore the fringes of arguments are you're going to drive yourself crazy. Like uh, the hyper negative guy's been almost undefeated. Well, yeah. I mean, he's got a pretty good record. If I'm betting on one side or the other, I'm making right. a lot more money with the, the negative Nancy. I like to me, there's not an organization less deserving of the benefit of the doubt in any sport than this one. And I've argued that for years, yeah. but the difference and I'll finish here between this time and the other times, I cannot give you a valid football reason why they won't do it. Yeah. I, I don't, there's no curse Bobby Wayne. There's no, that's where I have to go right. to, 
to make the argument against him. I can't make an argument. It's legitimately has could. to be injury related. And well, it, I mean, that's just football, but right? That's, but like, that's, that's always that. That's always right. the, the that's, out clause in any argument. Yeah. I think that's that almost goes without saying. Like, right. oh, I picked the Chiefs to win the Super Bowl. Mahomes goes down, God forbid. Oh, good call on that one. It's like, no, I'm exempt. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, not on your gambling ticket, maybe, but at the water cooler, to me, I'm exempt. Obvi- but to me, it's but just in- not Jeff Okuda. Well, no, I was just going to say, it's, it depends what you're talking about. Gotcha. To, to me, it's just quarterback. It, you know, or if four of your five best defenders go down, maybe. But everybody's hurt, yeah. man. I mean, the, the, the... Well, that's the thing. So they were the worst defense in football last year. And I yeah. know that, that number is a little bit slanted by how bad they started. But yeah. it doesn't matter. End of the year, you finish with the worst defense in football. You get that to 20th. Just 20th. And your offense is close to the same. You're a better football team. You're a better football team in the win column. And if you get that defense to now 15th, now you're... A, probably a conference championship contender. Why isn't the offense like a very good bet to be better? I mean, Sewell's a year older. I would say another year in the golf system. Yeah. I think it's probably more against what you're fighting against. Like, I don't think you're going to be the chiefs. I don't think you're going to be the bills, but you can be, you can be as good as you were last year. I think the run game again, Montgomery is a better running back down after down, after down, right? Down for down. Um, I still don't know about the tight end position. I know they scored a ton of touchdowns last year, but like you said, like touchdowns are a little fluky and situational. Mm-hmm. Like I, I think I'd like to see more from them, especially with the emphasis on blocking, right? They use a lot of six offensive linemen. I think there's a room to add more to that room in the draft. Receiver's a little bit of a question mark, right? Like, I don't know what Marvin Jones has in the tank. I don't. Um, down year last year. He says he's doesn't feel any different in his body, but I, I think a lot of us at that age are probably in denial that we weren't in decline. Um, was never a big separation guy. And Jared Possession Goff's, receiver. Yeah, but Jared Goff's not a great quarterback at taking advantage of guys that don't get separation. So I don't, I don't know. I think a lot of it hinges on your X factor, right? It hinges on Jameson Williams taking a step. Doesn't need to be 100 catches, but can it be 55 with 20 of those being 20 plus yard explosive plays, then your, your offense is going to be as good, if not a touch better than last year. And I mean, you can see like Deshaun Jackson. uh, It's a great comp. I actually, I don't know. I brought it up to Dave Phipp and Dave Phipp didn't like it because he coached Deshaun Jackson, but I think it's a great comp. Yeah. He, he, to his credit, Phipp came up with a very description about how they reach their speed. Like he called Jamison oh, more of a strider versus yeah. a burst, but whatever. Talking like I, I think animal, very gazelle how there's right. they run. I don't give a shit about yeah. that. Like I, I'm talking about taking the top off the defense. Sure. Don't need him to be an elite receiver. Deshaun Jackson. I mean, if you pulled up his his year by year, I think he did have like one or two years where his numbers were elite. I don't think anyone ever really considered him like, oh, he's Julio Jones. No. Uh, I think that's fair. But you're talking like deep threat. Good second tier receiver. I mean, could be the number one, but like, you know, second tier receiver. Yeah. If he's that with Brown, if he's just Deshaun Jackson, which is a good yeah. but not a weak player, they're coming really roses. For That's sure. That's a great situation. Yep. You know, Marvin Jones can just be the the Mike Furry of of this area. You know, catch 60 balls, a bunch of seven yard dump routes, and he'll be fine. I don't think Marvin Jones has that much left in the tank. Probably not. I, I think I think that was a you know a, a cute little we can talk about his you know, wife's bunt cake thing and all that. It's a cute little homecoming story, but yeah. I don't know. Football, I'm not expecting much. I think it'll be solid. That Like I said, I think it, I think the getting him around Jameson is a, is a, nobody said it to yeah. me. I'm just, I'm just, no, yeah, just so. making an observation. I think it's, it's part of it. I do. It's definitely a positive. Mm-hmm. I, that's his, you know, he's a gym rat by all accounts. And, you know, he's like one of those 6% body fat guys. And everybody loves that guy. His, his wife's actually really nice. I don't know if you've met yeah. Martin, The whole just, family is just Yeah, lovely. they're an awesome family. Yeah. But anyway, Justin Rogers, appreciate you, man. I know you're, you're worn from your disc golf outings today. So I appreciate you making time. And uh, it was fun. And, I, you know, maybe I'll catch you on the bye week because you don't want to do anything other than sit with me during your, like, you what know. What year is that? Downtime, right? Twenty. Oh, you made me wait. You, you made me wait, like, two and a half years for this one. So it was good to have you. You're a fellow whiskey enthusiast. You know, we talked, we joked last time that I had to have the refill ready for you, and we forgot again. So that's all right. I'm going to get made fun of for another two years. At least I have shoes on this time. 
Justin Rogers, appreciate you, man. I'm looking forward to this season. I'm happy that you're covering a team that should be good. I mean, it is a thing with you guys. You've been through hell too in your own way. Can't imagine covering this team over the years as you have. Yeah, we Mostly bad. Early, early off season every year. Well, that that's probably the least of your problems. It's yeah. just the nature of the season sucks. I'm not looking forward to all those primetime games, though. Not gonna lie. Just that's that's no, a that's self oldest, that's a selfish beat writer complaint. That's a Chris Solari complaint. Chris Solari's golf clapping somewhere in the hallway. Like look at man, you can have all the primetime games at home you like. Those road primetime games are brutal. You guys would be brutal. better off weighing in on politics like Dave Burkett does Pass. than talking about what that you don't like. Complaints on the jobs, yeah. I mean, like, well, that specific complaint. Because yeah. I mean, I was telling you, you know, friend the friend, if you can call us friends. Fans hate the oh, not another seven o'clock, you know, evening kick. Especially like Solari. I, I, Solari is such a glutton for punishment. I don't know why he does it because he gets no, shit every nobody time. Nobody likes leaving a stadium at three in the morning and getting on a flight at seven in That's, the morning. I'm not saying you will like it. I'm yeah. not saying that. Just. Fans don't want to hear that. Week. Yeah, I know. I know. Like that's the one that that's the biggest like sort of gripe between. It's not it's like a Detroit thing. I, they do it nationally. Like, none of you guys like. It. I don't blame yeah. you for not liking it. But fans are like, fuck that. I mean, most fans yeah. actually like the primetime games, so for obvious reasons. Sorry, we'll make we'll make Monday after primetime games. Nolan Bianchi's problem. I, Nolan's a good guy, even though he you know had me on his show and never invited me back and then quit, so I wouldn't have uh, any chance at a return. Once again, I side with Nolan here. I'm a hundred percent. You is deserve. there anybody you could line up against me that you'd be like, all right, for that guy, I'm taking Justin's side. Mm. Is there a person on earth? Like yeah, let's say, no, let's, say non, let's say non felons. Like if they're if they've committed mass genocide, they're not included. Like, yeah, no, there's there's plenty of people. Okay, well, I'll give you some time to figure that for next yeah. time. I'll give you the whole three years to figure that one out. Ben, love you, Eric, love you, Spiro Avenue Show, Justin Rogers. Drafts what two weeks from tomorrow? Today, on the horizon. I don't know what day this is. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, what year is it? See you guys, Spiro Avenue Show. We're out.